Hey gang, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Tonight we're going to be talking about 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, and we're going to be covering the topic of the validity of Scripture. It's a critical issue for the church, and it always has been, so I hope, I hope you'll enjoy this tonight. But before we do that, let's jump into a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into our study. So let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word that you've given us that's a guide and a lamp unto our lives. We ask that you instruct us tonight so that we might be more like you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, gang, for eons, it seems that the church has faced the challenge of the validity of Scripture. It's happened time and time and time again. For example, during the Enlightenment period, uh, it was a constant battle for the church uh, that had attacks coming from all different angles uh, because the Enlightenment period really felt that the truth was going to be found in science and human reason and materialism. And they attacked anything that was of religion or tradition or custom. And you remember many of the men that you, you studied throughout your days, uh, both in high school and college, when you went to philosophy class were men of that genre. Men like Thomas Hobbes, uh, who studied materialism. He was one of the proponents of the Enlightenment period. Other men like Benedict de Spinoza. Uh, other guys like David Hume, Immanuel Kant, um, Frederick Schleiermacher, a guy that I studied in seminary. Um, a guy by the name of George W.F. Hegel. You guys all have heard of him before, I'm sure. Another guy, Albrecht Rickschel and Adolf von Harnack. Uh, they were both proponents of theological liberalism. And then we get into a guy like Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche. You probably all heard about Nietzsche. Uh, I got another guy that I had to study in seminary as well. And then a guy named Rudolf Bultmann another guy that I had to study in seminary, and Martin Heidegger, uh, all existentialism and postmodern relativism proponents. And then the final guy is really F.C. Bauer and Julius Wellhausen, two guys that were uh, proponents of what is called higher criticism. All of those, those people are thought leaders in the Enlightenment period. But you know, Throughout history, the church has always had men who have fought for the battle of the validity of Scripture. And during this period, there were other guys that also were on the other side of the fence, fighting for the truth of Scripture and the validity of Scripture. Men like Francis, Francis Turretin, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Hodge, Benjamin B. Warfield, and J. Gresham Mason were all guys that I had to look at in, script, in, in seminary all great Christian men who fought for the validity of Scripture. But you know, when you look at, at Scripture, the attacks didn't just happen during the Enlightenment, Enlightenment period. Um, that's why Peter writes 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And when we look at Scripture, we see it alluded to all the time. For example, Psalm 19, 7 says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You see, that's where the scriptures come forth that is really the source of all wisdom. Um, and so we would be wise to listen to God's word. And then Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what I propose and shall succeed in the thing for which it, I sent it. You see, the, the image here is that God's word goes forth and it always has an impact in the world. And then finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. through 5, Listen what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church which was a church that was very troubled. Listen to what he says. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to, destroying, to destroy households. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 
So you see, throughout history, we've seen this attack against God's word. It's not unusual. Now listen to what Peter has to say in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. He says this, beginning in verse 16. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture come from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I want you to notice that Peter gives two primary reasons uh, in his defense of God's Word. First he says in verses 16 through 18, he's got his own personal eyewitness account of everything that's gone on. That's a critical lesson for us. And then second, in verses 19 through 21, he's got God's supernatural revelation. So let's, let's look at his own personal eyewitness account first in verses 16 through 18. I want you to notice that Peter links this section of scripture with the word for. So Peter was absolutely convinced of what he taught because he had personally experienced it. Notice that he includes all the other writers of the New Testament in this same thought with the phrase, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Did you notice that? So he's all encompassing of all the writers of the New Testament receiving this supernatural revelation that verified what they thought, taught, and wrote and preached. Now Peter's opening statement was also pointed at those who claimed he was only doing what he was doing to attract gullible followers and make money off of them. That was a very, very common practice in his day. And many false teachers would, would be slick in their words and, and propose different philosophies for monetary gain. We see that in Micah chapter 3, verse 11, and also for sexual favors in Jeremiah verse 23, verse 14. It was a very common thing. It was a common thing then, and it's a common thing today. Uh, you'll see that in many of the people that you see on TV today. Now, I want you to notice what he says also. That he says, we did not follow the cleverly devised myths. That's an interesting phrase. Notice he says we, and it's emphatic. We did not do this. None of us did this. Uh, and it's a reference all the way back to all those men that he talked about, as well as Peter, James, and John. Because you remember, those were the three men that were really core to the church. And then he says, cleverly devised. It's an interesting word. It comes from the Greek word sophizo. It means to make wise. Implying that they didn't use sophisticated, subtle methods to trick people. And then he says, myths. This word myths has a very specific meaning. It means tales of legendary gods and heroic figures who participated in miraculous events and performed extraordinary feats. You would know that as the Greek gods, for example. Uh, Peter denies drawing upon all this kind of stuff in order to, to make known his teaching. Now, he said this phrase, made known. It imparts, making, uh, imparts a new revelation, specifically the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's all about making known the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And apparently what was going on in the church is that there were many false teachers that were teaching falsehoods about Christ's second coming. Uh, Peter will confirm that again in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-4. through 4. And I want you to notice that Peter connects the phrase power and coming with Jesus Christ. It's a sure signal that he's talking about Jesus' second coming. The word coming in the New Testament means appearing or arrival, and it's always connected with Jesus' second coming. Now remember that Peter and other writers of the New Testament had seen the majesty of Christ first 
earthly ministry. They had seen his death and they had seen his resurrection and they actually saw his ascension. So Peter's point is that the false teachers can deny Jesus, but he and the rest of, of the apostles had actually seen all of this. They were eyewitnesses to it. Now the term eyewitness has a very, very, very specific meaning. Originally it meant a general observation of, of events, um, but over time the meaning of it changed. And what it was used in conjunction with people now in Peter's day was with people who watched a series of passion plays about a God. And only after becoming intimately knowledgeable of the subject, they were prepared and privileged to know the God intimately. So what Peter is saying is that he was an eyewitness to all the intimate details of Jesus' life. And he was saying that he knew Jesus intimately and therefore he was able to speak about what he saw. Um, he says they were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now the word honor here specifically means exalted status, and glory is radiant splendor, and the majestic glory is God the Father. That's what he's talking about. And this phrase, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, it could mean one of two events in Jesus' life. It could mean at the Lord's baptism or at his transfiguration. But the holy mountain that, that Peter refers to, which was probably Mount Hermon uh, in Caesarea Philippi in Mark 8.27, gives us the fact that this is, he's talking about the transfiguration here, where Peter, James, and John all saw the divine glory around Jesus. And you remember uh, that they also saw Moses and Elijah in that event as well. So what they were doing is tying back the Old Testament to the New Testament about Jesus. So what Peter is saying is, I've seen it all. I've seen every aspect of Christ's life. I've seen the glory that was given to him. And I'm an eyewitness to that. Um, now, this phrase, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, it is a really, really critical statement because it's the Father's affirmation that Jesus is both of identical nature and essence with him, and he is perfectly righteous. Therefore, he is the perfect sacrifice for us. It is a statement of his divine nature and, his, and the divine love of the Father for the Son. What a tremendous statement for, for the Lord to share, for all to hear, and for us to read. Now, when we go on to, to verses 19 through 21, we see God's supernatural revelation. And notice that Peter links verse 19 to his previous statement with and, revealing that the truth of God did not totally rest on the oral traditions of the apostles. Uh, the literal translation of the phrase is, we have more sure the prophetic word, indicating that Peter felt the word of God trump the experience of Peter, James, and John. So the word was, was central to, to the church. And again, we is a reference to all believers and, and, and that we possess something more secure than the collective experiences and the oral traditions of the apostles. We have the actual written word of God. Um, now the prophetic word really embraced the entire Old Testament. Uh, Paul confirms this in Romans 16, verses 25 through 27, when he says, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all the nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the one, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Jesus affirms this reality in John chapter 5, verse 39. He said this, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. You know, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the apostles recorded their experiences and their thoughts. 
uh, which validated the written words of the Old Testament time and time and time again. You know, the Jews always preferred the written word, not visions or experience, because they are not able to be validated. That was a critical tenet of the Jewish uh, teachers and, and lawyers. Um, they called these, they literally called these visions a word called bath call or the daughter of the voice. Uh, but they didn't trust them because they weren't, they couldn't validate them. Instead, they really leaned into the written word of God. And in essence, what Peter is saying is, if you don't believe me, then you need to go to the written scriptures for the proof that you seek about Jesus. Now, Peter reminds believers to which you, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. If false pre preachers or teachers are present, the answer is to know and carefully follow God's word. That has always been the core tenet of the church, to know and follow God's word, to reject false teaching. Um, we're going to see this next week when we study uh, the next uh, section of scripture in chapter 2 about the portrait of a false teacher. We'll see this come full, full course around back to us. He also uses a metaphor as a lamp shining in a dark place. Dark is, is literally a word that means dry or parched or dirty or murky or obscured. And the lamp of God's word provides divine revelation. Psalm 119 verses 105 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We are to keep searching God's word until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It is to be a constant focus of our life. So, uh, Keep searching God's word until the truth is revealed and Christ is revealed in your life and the day dawns. It's talking about Christ's second coming occurs to establish his kingdom and rid the world of sin. And the morning star literally means light bringer and it's referring to Christ. Uh, and it was a term used also for Venus which preceded the morning sun in, in the morning. So it's an interesting imagery about Christ that he, he, uh, he is our light of our life. But now notice that Peter also affirms that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Literally, the phrase means does not arise, originates, or comes from somebody else. Um, it, it comes into being based only from God, not based upon man's interpretation. And the interpretation is, is the genitive noun indicating the source of God's word. It's a statement of its origin. It's not about humans, but men spoke from God as they carried along by the Holy Spirit. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they carried along, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried means continuously moved, carried along, or borne along. So you see, what Peter is saying to the church is, listen, the the validity of scripture is sure because I've seen Christ, I've lived with him, I've walked with him, I've seen every aspect of his life, I testify to it, and it's in conjunction, it's in alignment with God's word. Therefore, you can trust scripture, and we should lean into that as Christians to stand firm in our faith. Now, here's some questions for discussion for us tonight. How are you seeing the attack on the Bible being played out today? Where are you seeing that? What are some of the false things people are following today because of their unwillingness to let God's word inform their life? It's all rampant. It's all around us. And if we're honest, we see it all the time. The prosperity gospel is one, for example. Um, the health and wealth gospel is another one. Uh, so you'll see it all over, but think about it and see where it is. You know, here's the second question. Many people are living for experience today. What are the implications of Peter's words to us when it comes to living from just an experience platform? What would he say to us? He would say, that's not the way we should live. Instead, he says, lean into God's word because it, it can be verified. Our experiences can't, but, but let's lean into God's word. And then finally, how has God's word illumined your life? How have you allowed it to, to reveal your, the, the crooks and the turns in your heart? And how has God protected you through his word? Think about that. Where have you used that as a protection for your, your life? 
uh, if we're true and honest, it happens all the time in our lives. So I hope you've enjoyed this tonight. Next week, we're going to look at a critical section of scripture that's going to talk about the portrait of a false teacher that fits nicely with this. So I hope you join us next week. And also, let me encourage you to come join us on Saturday night as we worship at Victory Life Church at 6.30 p.m. each Saturday night. The address is 155 Northwest 112th Avenue in Plantation, Florida, 33325. We would love to have you join us each week. Thanks and be blessed.